What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to HQ. This is BDGE, Big Dogs Got E Fantasy Football. I am Nicholas. Every Saturday, we're going to be coming at you with some DFS action. Now, I don't play DFS, but we have good friend of the show, Joe Holka, who is co-host of the Fantasy Footballers DFS podcast, as well as producing his own DFS content on his channel, which I will link it down below. You can follow him on Twitter. He has been on the channel before to talk about the behind the scenes of the fantasy football industry. So we will be talking all about DFS with Joe today and his top picks, some stacks he likes, and other nonsense DFS related, because I know a lot of y'all play DFS. We got to make sure all the dogs is eaten out here. This will be a two-part video, though. I will also be breaking down the player props. Now, we we are partnered with Monkey Knife Fight. They are the single best website to play player props and bring home the revenue. We're about to pay the mortgage with the player props. So I'll be diving into some of my favorite games on their website, monkeyknifefight.com. Later today, we'll be going live on YouTube, but it is for the Patreons only. So Saturdays, we're going to dip in twice. We're going to have this video, which is DFS and player props. Later on in the day, 1 p.m. Eastern time, we will be going live on YouTube. That is for Patreons only, where you can sign up on patreon.com slash BDGE, where you will get the private live stream, my weekly rankings, access to a private forum slash community where myself, Noah, Snacks, and Animal will be answering all of your fantasy football questions, and you will get my waiver wire article. It's an exclusive article. We will not be doing waiver wire videos on the channel, only on Patreon. So patreon.com slash BDGE. Today, DFS, player props, live stream. Let's get it. homies let's pay the mortgage if you trailed my picks last week you just about 10x your money to be honest with you i mean that's not going to happen every week but we nailed every pick we had if you bet the mortgage and you lose the mortgage we always got a place for you over here at the hq to crash if you need to so for those y'all new to monkey knife fight monkey knife fight is a player prop game website monkeyknifefight.com because as fantasy players we're way more into players individually statistics and we know a lot more about what's going on in the games from an offensive standpoint than a overall, you know, pace and over under and things like that. You think you know, but you don't. That's there's a reason why Vegas stays in business and you don't. But I do at the HQ. We're putting up numbers. If you want to play on monkeyknifefight.com, if you want to trail my picks, head over there. If you use the promo code BDGE when you sign up, you will get a 100% deposit match. So start off small, throw 25 in there, trail my picks for this week, double it up. They'll already give you 25 on top of that because of the 100% deposit match bonus. And thus, you will have three times your money. Pretty good proposition. What I like to do is pick games where I think there are exploitable defenses or if I think there's a blow-up spot for individual players. And there are a couple on the slate in this one. And the first one that actually comes to mind is the 49ers and the Bengals. Now, there are plenty of different options that you could choose to play on. There are regular like touchdown totals, reception totals, any of them with the white little thing here that says fantasy points are obviously relevant to fantasy points. Now, what we saw from last week in Cincinnati was Zach Taylor taking over this offense and the team threw the ball 51 times compared to 13 running back rushes. Do I think that was fluky? No, I think we're seeing Zach Taylor come over from McVay's offense and running the 11 personnel. And I think that was a big reason why we saw Ross, John Ross blow up. Tyler Boyd caught eight of 11 targets. I think this is going to be a very pass heavy offense going forward. They passed the ball, I believe, on 85% of their neutral game script plays last week. Joe Mixon is dealing with a bum ankle, which tells me that even if he is playing, they are going to go a lot less run heavy. So what I want to do is get a lot of exposure to this Bengals passing offense because I don't think a lot of people are going to adjust. They're just going to say, ah, it's Andy Dalton. Ah, it's the Bengals passing offense. It was fluky. I think there's a realistic chance that Andy Dalton finishes the year as a top 10 passer in terms of yardage. He can easily hit that 4,500 yard mark. What I think I'm going to do is look at these fantasy point over-unders. And there's one that I saw earlier that I liked a lot. George Kittle and Tyler Boyd. Realistically, I'm not betting on this game because I think the Niners are going to do well because I don't think Jimmy G has looked good whatsoever. But if there's one player that I obviously like here, it's George Kittle. If there's one player I love on the Bengals, it is Tyler Boyd. Now, these scoring settings, if you hit the little I down here, will give you the settings, and this is full PPR. You have to pick two of two correctly in order to 2.3x your money. So if you throw down five bucks, you will win 10 or $11 or some shit, whatever. Someone do the math. It gives you the multiplier up here. So what we're going to pick for our first game is we're going to take the over on George Kittle. He would have smashed that last week, but he had two touchdowns called back. So we're going to go over on George Kittle, and we're going to go over on Tyler Boyd. With Tyler Boyd, he's one of those players that I think just has a 
a fantastic floor. Like we saw it last week, right? Eight catches for 60 something yards. And he's someone that gets in the end zone as well, right? He caught seven or eight touchdowns last year. The fact that he didn't catch one last week means he's probably due. So even if he doesn't though, I love the floor that he gives you as a full PPR player. So I love Boyd going over 14 and a half. I love George Kittle to go over 15 and a half because he's going to get his, he's going to get his targets, especially in the red zone. And he'll probably capitalize on a touchdown in this one. They're in Cincinnati. So that gives me even more hope when it comes to the Bengals offense. So again, you know, you choose your two things and each one you could either go like it tells you how many you have to get right. So there's like an over under for fantasy points where you have to get three out of four gives you a little bit more leeway. But yeah, you choose this one and then you choose however much money you want to throw on it. And then it tells you the prize and the buy-in, whatever, whatever, whatever. So that would be my first take right there. George Kittle, Tyler Boyd, both over on their fantasy points. And we'll cruise around a little bit and see what else we like here. I really want to get in on some some Matt Breida action. So I'm going to find a three for four fantasy points one. I would probably double down on this one and go with Dalton over, George Kittle over, Tyler Boyd over, and probably Jimmy G under. Where are you, Matt Breida? Since Tevin Coleman's going to be out, a lot of people are going to be off him. They're like, ah, Breida couldn't handle it. He can't handle the workload. When Coleman's out, you know, that sounds familiar to another player that couldn't handle the workload just a week ago. Austin Eckler, and he's been pretty fucking good, huh? We want some Breida action. It's Matt Breida versus John Ross. Now, John Ross kind of scares me because he looks so damn good, so I'm not really looking to bet against him. So what we might do is just run it with that over on Tyler Boyd and George Kittle and then go look at some other games. But obviously, I want to make this short for you guys, and you guys can kind of get the gist, and I want you to get on here. So again, monkeyknifefight.com. If you use promo code BDGE, you will get a 100% deposit match. Throw 10 bucks in there, throw 20 bucks in there, you will get 10 or 20 bucks. Bike. The other game I'm looking at is KC and the Oakland Raiders. The Raiders. They're looking pretty good, huh? So I don't really know what to make of Derek Carr in this offense yet. So what I want to do is this touchdown dance. The dance. So basically, pick the players that will get the most total touchdowns. So you get to pick skill players. The goal is to, they give you an over-under, right? One and a half, two and a half, three and a half. And depending on how many touchdowns your collective skill players score, you get either 1.5x the money that you put down, 4x or 10x the money. So this is a great game, obviously, to do so. This is one of the highest scoring slates on the week. I believe it's an over-under of about 52 points. KC is going to get theirs, of course. If we're looking at players on the day, Kelsey, comes to mind right away. It's interesting between Sammy Watkins and Damian Williams. Now, Watkins obviously went off for three touchdowns last week. I still think he's a top 10 wide receiver this week from a season-long standpoint, but I have more faith in the running backs getting in the end zone. So I like Damian Williams to cap off one, if not two touchdowns. And then Josh Jacobs, on the other hand, I mean, he's getting all the goal line carries. They should be down and trailing. So it's going to be interesting to see how they divvy up the backfield work. If they are down, you know, 10 points or two touchdowns or whatever, do they get Jalen Richard more involved? But in the first half, I mean, maybe they'll be able to keep it relative close. If they get any goal line look, it's going to be the Josh Jacobs. So he has a good chance of just getting in on a one yard plunge. I kind of like Darren Waller or Tyrell Williams, but we'll, we'll take the safety of the running backs. So we have Travis Kelsey, Damian Williams, Josh Jacobs. All they got to do is score collectively two touchdowns together. And we're going to get 1.5 X our money. If they end up going with three, you know, if Damian Williams pops off for two touchdowns and then we just need one other touchdown from the other guys, then we're getting 4X our money. So you could throw $5 down, you'll win 20 bucks. $10 down, you'll win 40 bucks. I'm a big fan of this one. I haven't really looked at the fantasy points for the other players yet. I think Damian Williams is in an absolute smash spot right now. Patrick Mahomes over 22 and a half fantasy points. Man, that's gotta be fucking easy money. I think I would hit both of these as well. Patrick Mahomes over 22 and a half. He's just, that's just guaranteed basically. And then Derek Carr over 15 and a half. Again, I don't really know what Derek Carr is yet, but they're going to be trailing. They're at home. They're playing against the Chiefs. So there's going to be plenty of passing for Derek Carr. This is just a game I would go all in on and just nail the over-unders. Over 300 and a half. Darren well Waller over four and a half receptions. Rushing yards for Josh Jacobs, 72 and a half. I'd actually take the under on that. I don't think they're going to have enough game script for him to, he rushed for 85 yards last week on 23 carries. He's not getting 23 carries this week. So I'll take the under on that one over on that one. But yeah, y'all get the gist. So the two games that I am hammering are the KC Chiefs and the Oakland Raiders, as well as the Cincinnati Bengals 49ers, more so on the Cincinnati Bengals side of the ball. So I hope y'all enjoyed my little monkey knife fight section, which I will be doing every Saturday, helping y'all pay the mortgage. We are one for one on the year. Week one was a massive success. Hopefully week two brings just as bright of a day for y'all. And we're going to hop over to the DFS portion of today's video with our man's Joe Holka. See you then. All right, big dogs. Welcome back to the DFS portion of the Saturday video. We are joined by friend of the show, Joe 
Polka, DFS specialist. I know you uh, you smashed last week, it seemed like, right? You sent me a DM, I think it was three quarters or so of the way through the games, and you were uh, rocking first place in, in multiple uh, entries that you had going, right? Yeah, I might have uh, sent you that a little bit too early because um, I actually ended up uh, getting down uh, a little bit from there. Still massively uh, profitable week. Uh, not quite the the five-figure score uh, that I had uh, most of the day. Uh, I was sitting in first until that second uh, defensive touchdown for uh, the 49ers. And then uh, also that overtime game just killed me with a, a couple of teams uh, passing me at the last second there. But that's the way she goes. Uh, I guess from the DFS perspective, you're kind of in between a a 2v2 and you make the wrong decision sometimes it can cost you a lot of money which uh, in season long can cost you as well but in DFS it hurts a little more sometimes yeah as long as the revenue is uh, is profitable um, so for everyone out there watching you'll be able to find Joe's social stuff down below in the description on Twitter on on Instagram on you know uh, Twitch is a big platform and we are going to be going live from now on this recording we do on Friday afternoons what we're going to do is still record it and upload it onto my channel Saturday. But this portion of the video, we will be doing live on Joe's Twitch channel. So I will link that down below. I will also shoot out a notification via Twitter and, uh, and YouTube, like the community tab when we do go live. So you guys can actually hop in, watch us record this, and we'll probably do a quick Q&A session at the end or maybe throughout it. So that'll be a cool little uh, spice up for the video for y'all that ask a lot of sit start questions. Maybe we'll dive in and other DFS relevant content. So all we ask is that if you do enjoy the video, you smash that thumbs up button. You subscribe to the channel if you are new. Same with Joe's channel over there. All that info down below. Let's dive into this week's slates. Now, luckily for most people, uh, Christian McCaffrey was not available in the main slate because he would have lost a lot of people a lot of money. So we still have some uh, some good players available, thankfully. What are you looking at this week? Overall strategy, you can jump in position by position, or is there anything glaring out to you just uh, right off the rip? Yeah, so in week one, I, I think the biggest thing from a tournament perspective is just not to overblow things that happened in week one. Um, so there's, there's plenty of situations that I'm sure you've talked about uh, throughout the week that um, we maybe don't consider uh, something that's going to continue, uh, maybe a uh, sell high type candidate, same thing in DFS, like these guys that were sub 5% owned that help people win the millionaire maker on DraftKings, they're not going to be 5% owned this week. It uh, doesn't mean that you can't play these guys again. It's, it's totally case by case, but um, you do want to kind of target um, positions where um, it makes sense to go a little bit more different. So like, for example, last week, I, it actually was a really good example of kind of how I play. Like I paid up for Christian McCaffrey at running back. Um, and then I actually uh, play Dalvin Cook. Like Dalvin Cook was James, basically um, just severely underpriced. We talked about him on the show yeah, last I feel week like as well. Pretty much everybody you brought up on yeah. that show like just smashed. It was the, it was them. It was you know Michael Gallup, San Francisco defense. I was like, let's go. Yeah, I didn't even take my own advice and play San Francisco defense. So that <laughs> that was frustrating. Uh, but yeah, I mean, start off on a good foot. Hopefully, you guys jumped into a few games. Uh, but just in general, I, I think that the one thing I did really well last week was get on a couple of really low owned wide receivers. Ended up playing uh, Josh Allen to uh, John Brown, uh, which is a kind of a lower Dang. owned stack, which was great. Um, had Deshaun Jackson. Um, all those guys were sub 5% ownership in the tournament that I was playing. So um, again, if you guys didn't check out the video last week, I, I kind of uh, play the smaller field GPPs. Uh, it's the $1,500 buy-in, but it's still the same type of strategy no matter what you're doing. It's totally different than trying to beat 100,000 people in the millionaire maker or something like that. So um, I had someone actually call me out uh, on my channel this week and they were like, well, I don't have $1,500 to play. Why would I even watch this? It's like, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about playing small fields, like winnable tournaments. So I think that's the best way to kind of build your bankroll in DFS. So um, a couple low on wide receivers was great. Um, and then uh, really paying up at running back. And then at tight end, I'm always trying to either pay all the way up or pay all the way down. Uh, so last week I ended up playing Kelsey. Um, didn't completely work out. I think he only had three catches for like 80 yards or something like that. Um, right. But I mean, that's basically the floor you're going to get from Kelsey. So uh, a lot of things did go right uh, last week. Uh, a lot of things that um, didn't go right as well. So the chalk wide receivers, so the really popular wide receivers, the the Curtis Samuels, the D.D. Westbrooks, the, the Godwins of the world, they just they, they did fine, uh, but they weren't helping you win GPPs. So that's that's why I always stress at wide receiver to really target these guys that have upside. Um, and you can always get them at kind of a cheaper price as well. Running back is by far the easiest to project as far as volume. And that's the most important thing always. So that's where I'm paying up. Um, this week is uh, pretty similar in a lot of ways. I'm actually going to go back to 
uh, a similar situation that uh, I was with the Christian McCaffrey, but uh, Alvin Kamara against the Rams. I think he's yep. probably one of the best plays on the board if we're talking about guys that we're going to pay all the way up for. Um, so, I mean, just uh, last week alone, I know we had Christian McCaffrey last night on, on Thursday night football, but in week one, uh, 11 targets, 10 catches, 81 yards just through the air. Um, so I think that Kamara is, is definitely dynamic enough to, to do something similar to this Rams team. We talked about how they lost in Dominican Sioux. Um, so even on the ground, I think he could definitely do some damage. So I'm all over Alvin Kamara at running back. Um, and for just looking past um, some of like the really uh, expensive players, there's a few that, that people are kind of on um, as far as uh, the cheaper side of things as well. I definitely think that um, the, the one thing that I will say is um, – I don't typically pay down at running back unless it feels like it's like kind of a, a free square type of situation. So um, I, th I think that if you were going to pay down at running back, you want to try and get that volume, right? So um, someone like Austin Eckler, he's, he's only in the, the 6K range, but Josh Jacobs is going to be the one that's probably the most popular on DraftKings as a whole. That's uh, crazy. 4,700 yeah. right now on DraftKings? Right, yeah. So like you get kind of a discount on Monday Night Football as well sometimes because the pricing comes out before Monday Night Football as well. He was uh, starting out, he still was probably underpriced last week, but 24 touches last week. I mean, he only had uh, 48% uh, of the touch there in <laughs> Oakland, and he wasn't really active in the passing game at all. But they were so far ahead, they didn't really have to get him involved there. So I think he's a guy that's talented enough to still be involved in the passing game. Um, so in the DFS space, we kind of call that a free square. Um, a lot of times you just kind of jam that guy in and he allows you to pay up elsewhere. Um, we'll get the same thing happen with injuries throughout the year um, where we just get these running backs that you can project for 20 touches or so um, in like the, the really low uh, kind of salary range. So he's a guy that I I'm definitely uh, considering in cash games and even my main tournament team as well. Um, I think you want to keep an eye on, on Joe Mixon throughout the week. So he's questionable with a sprained ankle at this moment. So uh, Gio Bernard would definitely kind of vault into one of the top value plays at running back as well if, if Mixon is out. Um, I, I kind of touched on Eckler quickly, but I think that people, like we talked about not o like overselling week one, I think Austin Eckler is, is the real deal. And his yeah. price is probably going to take a couple weeks on DraftKings to really catch up to where it should be. Um, from a volume perspective. So I don't love that game in terms of pace and all that. Um, but I, I love Austin Eckler this week, especially if, if people um, still think that he's going to be kind of like this um, pass catching back, just not really going to get a ton of touches overall. Those are extremely valuable on something like DraftKings in particular, full PPR there. Um, so those are kind of the guys that I'm zoned in on at running back. I, I think Saquon's an interesting one. And I actually want your take on this. He, he's 9,200 on both sides. So he's like the most expensive player um, I'm nervous because he was obviously taken out of the game when uh, the Giants were down by so much in week one. I don't know if I can pay 9200 for a guy that's going to get three quarters. Um, maybe I'm kind of overreacting to that. Saquon is, is always kind of one of my guys. Uh, what are your thoughts on Saquon as a whole in fantasy right now? Yeah, it was kind of weird to see him with that touch count so low. How are you not going to give Saquon 25 touches? And I think his volume does scoot back up. But if Kamara's $1,000 less on the price point, I don't see a reason to play Saquon over Kamara. I'm right with you right. there. I think, like, it's the same thing that we saw with Carolina. It's like they the Rams do such a good job of getting pressure right up the middle. So the quarterbacks are kind of forced to dump it off their running backs. And the Saints already do such a good job of that. So um, if I'm paying up for one, it's definitely Kamara. I would I would agree with you on basically all of the other running back takes that I have. I own a lot of Eckler in season long. Yep. He's, he's just so like, you know, it, it, obviously you want the volume, but he's also getting the volume. But it's from a passing work. It's the same thing with Kamara. It's like yep. you feel a little bit weird using him as your RB1 or whatever, or drafting him as your RB1. But when the touch is, those two offenses, I've been saying this for a while, they operate very similarly in the fact that they have these older veteran quarterbacks. They know they have a, a small window to get back to, you know, the playoffs and the Super Bowl and make a run like that. So their main objective is to keep these veteran quarterbacks on their feet. What do they do? They use the running backs in the passing game. They use a lot of short passes. That's why Drew Brees doesn't really throw down the field anymore to Michael Thomas. They use so much of their play util utilization to get him the ball out of his hand so he's not on the floor and he doesn't get hurt because obviously if one of those quarterbacks go down, they get hurt. And that's why Eckler, it's like, you could say these touches and the efficiency is, is fluky, but it's not because that's just the way their offense is designed to get the ball in, in these playmakers' hands. So Eckler would be a guy I think you need to have in your lineups. Um, it's definitely not fluky. Maybe, you know, the yardage total and the touchdown total, of course, is fluky, but I think he gives you a ridiculous floor in PPR formats. I'm curious as to your thoughts on Matt Breda. I mean, obviously, Geo would be a smash spot as well if Mixon misses time. What I think is going to happen is Mixon's going to play. He's going to end up playing like, 
you know, 48% of the snaps. Gio is going to play 52% of the snaps or something, and they're probably both unusable. Brady's a guy that I love. I, he reminds me of an Austin Eckler, right? I think they're kind of like the same player being utilized a little bit differently. I think Breda is, is due for a bust out game because, I mean, we saw it plenty of times last year and people are definitely like a little bit off him. He's still a cheaper play. People are off him just based on what we saw last week where he carried the ball, you know, 10 or 15 times or whatever for like 37 yards. But this week, you know, I think he's a prime bounce back candidate knowing that he's going to be the 1A in that backfield. And we have Raheem, Raheem Mostert, which I actually think is low key like a – not a terrible play on in like GPP or something like that. Um, but I'm curious to know your thoughts on, on Breda. Yeah. So I, I think the biggest difference in DFS and season long is, yeah, you can get kind of a spot start from some of these, these guys, um, Matt Breda in particular, like if you're getting your 15 touches from a guy um, that's basically sitting on your bench most of the time, anyway, if you have some depth or it's a bye week it's totally fine in DFS, giving up the upside from these massive usage running backs, I think is a big mistake. Um, so I love Breda. Like he's someone that performed really well in my rushing expectation methodology. And, and we talked about um, you and I actually did in the off season about Alvin Kamara in particular and how he's just schemed the ball in different ways. Like there's such yeah. thing as quality of touches. Right. So I, th I think that getting someone like Kamara into your lineup, you know, that he's going to be put in positions to succeed. So even if I, I would much rather have like my, my 18 to 22 touches from Alvin Kamara um, at that price and spend my salary where I know it's somewhere that has a ton of upside and safety then paying down at the running back position that's just so valuable like when we're trying to project players like there's a lot of safety involved and a lot of security involved in just like putting your salary into that position so um, I think great is probably fine if you're you're rolling out like a bunch of lineups so that if you're playing 150 if you're playing even some 20 max stuff having some exposure to Breda is probably fine um, it'd be mostly like a game stack situation for me. So if I'm really trying to load up on, on a game that I think is high paced, I think that's a situation I would land on a player like that. But more often than not, if you're playing single entry, I I'm going to really try and get up to some of these studs. Um, Josh Jacobs is different. Austin Eckler is different because we can still project them to see a pretty massive workload. Um, Dalvin Cook is, is still right there too at 7,200 on DraftKings. I still think that he's relatively underpriced. I, I just hate the pace in that game it's really hard to get behind a team that's going to throw the ball 10 times. So not just the fact that, yeah, Dalvin Cook's going to get touches, but like the touchdown expectation there is probably a little bit lower than some of these other guys we've talked about too. Yeah. Those are two of like the, my most intriguing storylines going into week two is this Minnesota offense. You know, I think this week I'm going to, I'm a, I'm a Falcons fan. So I know that our defense is really not actually good. So people are getting hyped up about the Minnesota game. They're hyped up about the Falcons in general coming into the year. And I'm like, I don't think we should be because this defense is always hypothetically or, you know, through theory has supposed to be good, but it never really is. So I was not surprised by that Dalvin Cook blowout game whatsoever in week one. But now they're playing this Packers defense that looks very, 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 very improved. And I'm like, this is going to be a good test, especially in Lambeau. We're going to see, you know, what this Minnesota offense really is. So really intrigued to see how um, – like just the volume that Dalvin Cook gets in a game that's a lot closer. Do they look to dump him the ball off more when they're not up by 21 points? Yeah. And we last Jacobs, kind of the same thing. It's like we saw them dominate. So obviously they're going to give him a ton of touches. This time they're going to KC. You know, it's going to be eight or nine points, I believe the spread is. So does he actually take the passing work? I mean, he only caught one ball, looked right. really good on that one catch. But, you know, they're going to have to go away from the run game. Do they that's, leave Jacobs in? You know, that's what scares me because, you know, you, you do say like you want to chase the volume and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it almost seems like, you know, there's a possibility that Jalen Richard comes in and catches oh, yeah. five of six targets, and then you're left with, like, 16 fucking carries from Josh Jacobs for 70 yards. This, this is why DFS is so great, because it's not really about projections. It's not about any of that. It's about beating others. Um, so if Josh Jacobs and his projected ownership right now is pushing 30%, and if you're right, if we end up seeing some Jalen Richard and you don't have Josh Jacobs in your lineup, if you decided to pay up at running back and maybe pay down at wide receiver, you're already unique from those 30% of teams that play Josh Jacobs that got basically just a, an average performance, right? Like if he touches the ball 15 times, great, adds a couple touches, and then Jalen Richard comes in and catches the ball eight times in, in garbage time, you're going to hate yourself for playing Josh Jacobs for the fact that you're just basically holding hands with the rest of the field when it's a huge spot where if you do make that pivot, you kind of vault up the leaderboard at that point when that one underperforms. Let me ask you something. This is how much I don't know about DFS. You know, when you talk about ownership percentages, right? Mm -hmm. How exactly are those, are those, are those just given out by DraftKings and FanDuel? Like, do they tell yeah. you the ownership percentages prior to the games? 
Okay, so the, on, the ownership projection is basically there's there's sites out there that um, that actually come up with a projection for what they think ownership is going to be like. Um, there's a site out there that actually tracks every time a guy is mentioned on social media and articles and all mm -hmm. that side. It's really in depth. Um, but um, as soon as the games lock, like on your DraftKings lineup, it'll tell you what percentage that guy is owned. So but you won't know um, it. You but you won't, won't know, know it before. before. No, you, the best you've got is using a projection before. So like. Um, basically one of the projections that I use, I'll, I'll, I'm looking at it right now. They've got Alvin Kamara at 31 to 40% projected. Um, and this is like for the large field million millionaire maker stuff. So, um, that's kind of how you can hopefully, um, get on some wide receivers that are lower owned. Um, so like we'll, we'll get into wide receivers, but like Tyrell Williams, like Tyler Boyd, John Ross, those guys are projected to be pretty high owned relative to the field. And then guys that are going to be like super low owned like uh, that still are, have a little bit of upside. Uh, the Pittsburgh guys like James Washington, um, zero to 1% is his projection, but he still has a pretty decent ceiling rating there. So um, yeah, so like if you're playing DFS seriously, you want to definitely try and um, get on a site that has ownership projections because that's such a big part of it. You'd say those are pretty accurate, the ownership projections? I would, yeah. So it depends on what contest you're playing. Um, so um, in particular, like myself, I have to think of it a little bit differently. So if we go back to the San Francisco 49ers uh, uh, kind of uh, detail last week, uh, they were owned only 4% in the Millionaire Maker. And I'll always kind of parallel that. It's the biggest tournament every week on DraftKings. There's right. 200,000 people in it. Um, so he was only, it was only 4% on that defense. And the $1,500 entry that I play, it only has 80-some uh, people in it, so very small. It was 22% owned. So just right there, you can see that there's better players in some of those contests at the higher stakes. Um, so I'm, I'm projecting ownership a little bit differently than, than the casual player would. Um, but the, the good news is the ownership projections on a lot of these sites are, are pretty strong. Um, and, and they're kind of for like the more general public anyway. Okay. And those sites, what, do you have any that you would recommend to people? Are they all, I'm assuming most of them are like paid sites. That's part of the, like their DFS. Yeah. Yeah. There, there's a bunch. Um, I used to work for fantasy labs. They've got decent ownership projections. I think Fanshare sports is probably the best one. And I, I don't get paid by them whatsoever. I just, that's one of the ones that I use. Um, I, they're the ones that actually like kind of bring something together. They almost have like a model for it. That's kind of tracking social media and all that. And it's really accurate cool. um, for, for some sports. It's better than others. Uh, but NFL, it's actually pretty solid. All right, cool. I'll, uh, I'll link those suggestions down below for any of you guys that happen to be interested. Now, as we get deeper into the season, we'll see more injuries at the running back position, which obviously opens up a lot more, you know, of those free squares or value at the running back position. So if Mixon gets hurt, you play Geo at 4,500 or whatever, which leaves you with a lot of money to mess around with. Now, if you know that one of your, you know, of the three running backs that you're playing, one of them is like 4,000 bucks, with that extra money, is that very much on a week-by-week -week basis? Or for the most part, you're hammering two very expensive running backs? Or when is, it, when is like the right time to start looking at um, like very high upscale wide receivers? Because sure. this week I'm looking at, you know, Michael Thomas against the Rams. I feel like he's about to feast in PPR. And then yep. you kind of like – I feel like Keenan Allen is almost a must-play guy because of all the injuries that are taking place in, um, in L.A. right now. Yeah, Juju's up there too, um, as far as higher price guys. And it is a week to week um, type of thing. Um, I, I'm not saying you can never play uh, these wide receivers that are expensive, right? Like I'll definitely have uh, DeAndre Hopkins my share this year. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest thing is just making sure that um, you're kind of correlating correctly. So if you're playing Deshaun Watson, and you do have one of those weeks where you have a lot of extra salary, it definitely makes sense to pair him with DeAndre Hopkins. Um, mm -hmm. I think that more often than not, I just want to feel secure at, at running back. Uh, if it's one of those weeks like last week where Dalvin Cook was just a must play, um, then you do end up with a little bit of salary. Uh, those tend to be the weeks where I end up paying up for Kelsey or Kittle at tight end. Um, quarterback is an interesting position, and we can kind of transition into that a little bit too. Um, quarterback the salaries are very condensed, right? So we have Patrick Mahomes on DraftKings. He's 7,500. But if we just take him out of it, Lamar Jackson's 67. And then if we go all the way down almost, like someone like Mitch Trubisky is only 5,500. So the difference is only like 1,200 bucks. The difference yeah. in wide receivers is vastly different. So quarterback, if you have a little bit of extra salary, sometimes it makes sense to get up to a Deshaun Watson. Or if you have one of those weeks where you feel like Patrick Mahomes is just going to go completely nuclear, I, I think that that's kind of a, a lot of times where I'll end up throwing some salary, which is totally different than season long, right? Like season long, you're, you're just conditioned uh, to just do the late round quarterback approach. 
Um, I actually think that getting lower owned wide receivers in DFS is more important than just getting up to some of these mega studs. Cause like how often do you see some of these wide receivers just come out of nowhere? Like last week, Deshaun Jackson has like 150 yards, two touchdowns, and he's like 4,500 on DraftKings. So if you're shooting for upside and you get that blow up performance and it happens to be a week where these other wide receivers like Julio just have a, a decent performance they're, they're not, it's really hard for a wide receiver like that to pay off his salary basically that's what we talk about in dfs like the amount of points for a dollar spent it's much easier for these running backs to get there yeah i think also like those guys that end up with like blow up games that you don't really expect i think it's just a good idea to get them in your lineups especially if you're playing like the millie maker because of the way the nfl is going right they're first of all they're going way more pass heavy second of all these teams are obviously taking a lot more deep shots because we have them calling so many penalties down the field and now you're allowed to replay and, and challenge the pass interference so it's like why not if you're an offensive coordinator dial up two or three more extra plays you know per game where you're taking shots down the field because there's a good chance that one if not two if not all of them get a flag or it was a completed pass or whatever you know so it's like these guys who are usually very difficult to predict or project to have big games are more prevalent now than ever so like if I'm paying up for running back, yeah, I, I actually really like the idea of kind of hammering home those guys that have those big blow up spots, especially maybe like, a, I don't know, maybe I like the, the idea of stacking the quarterback and wide receiver. I don't know how much like you would do that in um, all the time. Yeah, you do that even yeah. in games where it's like you're just oh, trying yeah. to beat the half. Yeah, all the time. Um, and, and I'll give someone else, uh, you guys like some kind of uh, free advice too. So uh, my boy, Josh Hermesmeyer, he's the, the air yards guy. He has uh, airyards.com. The one metric that I really look at for DFS at wide receiver, it's called Whopper. It's free, areyards.com, you can find it. Uh, W-O-P-R is the metric. And it takes into account what you're saying. So these guys that are seeing deeper targets, but may not have connected on all of them, may not have like really gotten there uh, the week before, but it really quantifies volume better than any other metric at wide receiver. So like, for example, that's why you would maybe play a guy like John Ross this week over Tyler Boyd if Tyler Boyd ends up being super high owned because Ross was seeing so many more valuable targets downfield. And, and there's a met that metric really quantifies as you can find guys, especially if they, they have a couple weeks in a row where they're still seeing the right kind of volume. They just really haven't gotten there from a points perspective. Those are the guys that are always low owned. I'm curious, do you know what the Bengals ownership percentage is for the wide receivers Boyd and Ross this week? Yeah, it's actually pretty similar, but I think Ross is kind of catching some steam um, at the beginning of the week, Ross was like five to 10%. Now he's all the way up to 17 to 20. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think that like, it's a 2k difference in price on DraftKings. I think that Ross might actually end up being more popular by the end of the week. And I'll say this too, like these guys that are seeing deep targets, they're not the guys you want to play when they're 20% owned in tournaments. You want to play these guys when they're lower owned. So like right. if John Ross is approaching 25%, I'm probably not going to play him. I'll find someone else in that salary range that I think, uh, has more upside. Uh, so someone like Tyrell Williams is still going to be extremely heavily owned this week. I would prefer to play him when he's lower owned um, than when he is uh, higher owned. So like if we end up seeing like one of the guys that I really like to um, this week at, at quarterback is uh, just in general, I really like the Cardinals this week. So Kyler Murray, but if we're just going to kind of look at, at a pivot for wide receiver off of John Ross, someone like Christian Kirk, he's yeah. one of those people that was really popping in that stat that I mentioned before. Um, yeah, he's on air yards last week, yeah. right? Like 12 targets and almost yeah. down on air yards. Yeah, he looks like he's a good. Bounce and he's 4,500. So he's like the same price as John Ross, but you'll get him at five to 8%. So yeah. that's, that's what you want to do at wide receiver. And then if you do like Kyler Murray, because the kind of the chalk at quarterback right now, the highest owned is probably going to be Lamar Jackson after what he did last week. Um, so if you go the other side of that game, quarterback to quarterback in the same game has like one of the most high correlations there is. Um, so you can get a lot of upside and leverage just by playing the quarterback on the other side of it. I'm not super scared of, of uh, the Baltimore defense right now with the injuries they have. Um, so I actually really like the idea of going uh, Christian Kirk and Kyler Murray uh, in a stack because you'll get lower ownership and it's pretty cheap. It allows you to get up to some of those running backs we talked about. I'm curious for the Patriots situation now. Sony, you know, they're like 18 and a half point favorites. Sony Michelle should have a big game, but he's obviously not a guy that catches passes. So does a player like that that's in a smash spot for like season long leagues, like obviously you feel like he's going to score, you know, one, if yeah. not two, possibly three touchdowns. Is he a guy that finds his way into a lot of lineups? Because you know what, I'm, I'm looking at Brady's numbers. And I'm trying to do my weekly rankings and it's like, oh, they're such big favorites. They're against Miami. 
you know, Brady, they're just going to take the, the, their foot off the pedal, right? And Brady's not going to have a big game. I'm looking at splits and I'm like, dude, every time I went back through Brady's career and I pulled yeah. it from <clears throat> the road of his game splits, he's had 23 career games where they've been uh, two touchdown favorites or more. And he absolutely dominates in those games from a passing perspective, both volume and touchdowns. So I'm like, this, this seems like the easiest con <coughs> contrarian play right now because everyone's going to be like, oh, he's not going to pass the ball because it's Miami. They're going to get a big. And I'm like, there's no way that Brady doesn't finish the game with 275 and three touchdowns, right? So what's, what's your thoughts on, on Sony? What's your thoughts on Brady and maybe even stacking Brady with a pass catcher there to be a contrarian? Yeah. Um, so Sony is someone that will definitely be owned. Um, I think he'll be much more heavily owned on FanDuel for all the reasons you mentioned. He doesn't catch passes, but touchdowns are more important on FanDuel as FanDuel's well. FanDuel's half PPR, right? Yeah, half PPR. Um, so obviously way more important. Uh, it's more touchdown skewed over there. And usually the pricing is a little bit softer as well. Right. Um, so yeah, I think Sony, uh, he'll be popular. But yeah, I don't think people are going to play Brady for exactly what you just said. But in order to get to kind of uh, matching like that spread that massive spread it's it's possible that Brady just goes nuclear right well, like and he gets half, the first half he'll throw three touchdowns probably to get there. right yeah so I don't typically play guys that don't uh, use their legs um, in DFS but if you're just looking for a lower on stack in large field GPPs yeah it's crazy that they have this point total like we we rarely see anyone any team approach 33 implied points and like that's insane like that he's going to be two to four percent owned and and if we obviously don't have Antonio Brown this week which we're not really expecting the the target share there is actually more condensed than people realize there's not as many kind of weapons to to go to so yeah I like the idea of Brady if you were to pair him with like one of his wide receivers I, I think that uh depending on the Antonio Brown saga I think Julian Edelman are still probably be the highest owned he's almost 7k on DraftKings which is pretty expensive I like Josh Gordon again um, I think that he's super interesting especially if people aren't going to play him um, I, I think he probably is going to have a, a slightly different role than Antonio Brown anyway so I'm not sure that his role is really that much in question I think Phil Thorsett is the one uh, that is at the really cheap flyer if you wanted to go there um, I don't typically play James White but I mean if you really want to leverage off of Sony Michelle you just play James White yeah. Um, so, I mean, he's 5,100 and, and James White is someone that definitely would make sense with the Brady team because you kind of get that double correlation there. If they do throw for a touchdown, you kind of get both sides of that. Can't even bet in New York, but now I'm, I'm getting really interested in throwing in some lineups now on D DFS after these talks. We just got a, a, a minor alert because <clears throat> Antonio Brown's not going to be put on the commissioner's exempt list, okay. but Bill Belichick, unsurprisingly, not revealing, <sighs> excuse me, I don't know what's up in my throat right now. <laughs> All right, we back. Bill Belichick, unsurprisingly, not revealing if Antonio Brown will make his Patriots debut Sunday at Miami. Right. Quote, unquote, I'm not going to hand out a copy of the game plan here. We'll do what's best for the team. So we still have no idea if Antonio Brown will be playing this weekend. Um, I mean, I feel like even if he does play, there's no way you could throw him in your lineup. Like, we don't know what his snap count's going to be. He might end up with, like, three for 21 or something. But, yeah, I, right. just, I just think that a lot of people underestimate. Like, when you see a spread like that, it's like, yes, the team still has to put up that amount of points, though, to cover that spread. So they have to come from somewhere, and they're not going to run the ball just for the sake of running ball. Like, they'll do what's best to put up the points. And I feel like most, for the most part, it's, it's Brady there. Um, yeah, I've, I've gotten into trouble with avoiding those games in the past um, just because for exactly what you're saying. So, like, all the longer-term trends that you'll look at will tell you to, like, always target these tight spreads that are going to be back and forth. But I think these, like, dramatic kind of favorites, it, it does make sense, especially – with someone like Brady that you know he's going to be involved. I'm waiting for that that Gronk return. When do you think Gronk returns? Uh, whenever they give him his $10 million and the number 69, I guess is what he said, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems about accurate. Let's talk uh, about the tight end position, though. Yeah, uh, so tight end, um, it's it a position like – it's Evan Ingram, right? Or nothing. He is a guy. So like, I, I try and stay out of this, this mid range, right. But um, Evan Ingram could legit be one of the only weapons that they're throwing to in this offense at this point. Like yeah. Shepard, I think hasn't even cleared uh, protocol yet. He had 14 targets last week. Um, so again, like we talked about how DraftKings is going to take a couple weeks to get Eckler's price, right? Same yep. thing with Evan Ingram. Like, I think he's still drastically underpriced. Um, and this is kind of a, a spot where I kind of want to go back to Travis Kelsey again because last week everyone was kind of panicking in week one last year actually he had one catch I think in week one last year uh, so people were panicking and he went off for like two touchdowns and 130 yards in week two um, so like that's what you want to do at tight end too is really kind of go where people are fearing I'm not chasing anything at tight end so like 
TJ Hawkinson. He's yeah, like, nah. he's 3K again on DraftKings, so he's in play. Like he'll be owned. Same with like guys like Darren Waller, um, Mark Andrews back in play. All of those cheaper tight ends are going to be popular this week, I think. Um, but I'm interested in either going back to Kelsey um, or Evan Ingram because if you end up getting those mat like targets from like Evan Ingram, if he's 10 targets locked in, his floor is probably what like seven or eight targets. You're hoping for yeah. maybe four or five targets from some of these cheaper guys. Uh, so that's a spot where I would definitely go back there. I think you'll um, you'll be really happy with that. George Kittle, too. I mean, two touchdowns t- called back last week. That's what people that are just, like, casually playing that play George Kittle, they see the box score and they're like, ah, decent game, like, not great. They don't realize it almost was massive, right? Yeah, <laughs> so 25 points. Yeah, exactly. So th- those are the ones I'm on. There's really not a lot else at tight end this week. Um, I-, I think there's, there's probably some people that will pay down uh, for Delaney Walker. I- I'm not really in on that. If I'm paying all the way down, I'd rather just – um, play one of these guys that I think has a little bit more upside or fits a stack. So like Mark, if I'm playing Lamar, even though Lamar is super high on, I'll just throw, I'll just play Mark Andrews with him again. We talked about those two last week. Yeah, I like Darren Waller a lot, only because it's just going to be him and Tyrell getting you know 45 to a 50 percent target share. I feel like every yeah. single week, so he he becomes a nice floor play. And it seems like he's just going to post the same numbers that Jared Cook did last year. And if they're going to keep pricing him at 3300, I mean, why not? If you're not he, going to, he's the up. cash play for sure. For cash games, I think Darren Waller will be the most popular. What I love about him and what I actually don't like about Tyrell Williams is we know that Carr just doesn't want to push the ball downfield, so it doesn't really yeah. mesh well with Tyrell anyway. Like I know he had a good game last week, but I'd I'd rather get access to those exactly like those Jared Cook type targets from last year, and that's Waller. He's way too, way underpriced. Yeah, it just seems like he's going to go seven for 75 like every single week, and there you go. You don't have to worry about it. With Ingram, yeah, it's, it's Shepard. So what I learned yesterday when I was talking to um, Dr. Morse on my channel, who's the fantasy doctors, so when you go into concussion protocol, you're not allowed to clear the protocol for five days after it happens. So okay. if, if concussion happens on Sunday, the earliest they can be cleared, I believe, is like end of day Friday or early on Saturday. So if Shepard is cleared, it won't, we won't know it until either tonight or tomorrow morning. So it's not like, you know, he could have been cleared by like Tuesday or anything. He has to be in there. So Shepard, I mean, it still is very risky to put a player back into the game, you know, one week after they have a concussion because it gets them much higher re-injury risk or whatever for them to have another concussion. So Shepard is definitely a 50-50 at best here. Cody Latimer also missed practice yesterday with a calf injury. And he was like, uh, he got a, a huge chunk of the air yards for the Giants last week as yep. well. So it's like, there you go. More top targets are out for the Giants, which is why it's like, Ingram just seems like a ridiculous play for the um, the pricing that we see him at. It's 5,200 on DraftKings, which is 2,000 down from Kelsey. But yeah, I mean, I feel like if I'm making lineups, I'm probably smashing Ingram and, and Waller in uh, in most of them. Yeah, so if, if, if you're doing that, you're, you're definitely going to have some more salary to play with at wide receiver, which might end up being a little bit more, um, I guess, unique this week than others. Um, so I guess I want to I want to get your Sammy Watkins take. This is one that I missed on last uh Last week, he's all the way up to 7,200 now. They aggressively priced him up. Uh, a lot of times that doesn't happen. So what do you think about him this week? Yeah, I, I, I feel like there's no reason not to be in on him. I mean, he's not Terry Kill, of course, but damn, he actually looked good for the first time in a while. And he's going to be that wide receiver one. And I mean, if, if it's Miko Hardman, who came in last week, played a lot of the snaps, but didn't get targeted. I think it's him and uh, I think the Anthony Thomas, who didn't play last week, they said are going to kind of fill the void. So I'd imagine a lot of people are going to chase Miko Hardman. Yeah, he'll be popular. He'll be probably get close to 20% in tournaments. Like, I, I, he's pretty cheap. That's crazy, yeah. I, th- I'm, I don't know. I think Sammy Watkins pretty much comes with a, a, a super solid floor, but I'm not really sure if that's what yeah. you're for. I, I think everyone feels this way. Like, oh, he's too expensive. Can't play him now. So I, I'm going back and forth on this a little bit. I could certainly see Sammy Watkins having a pretty average game and then Kelsey just going nuts. Um, yeah. I think the ownership is going to be on Hardman. Um, which is which makes it an interesting kind of dynamic there. The price gap between those guys is is massive. Like um, Hardman, I was hoping would come in a little bit lower on, but people are on the Hardman and John Ross train. Um, so we're gonna have to figure out some other ways to kind of uh, get different at that position. And, and we haven't really touched on a, a, a probably enough of these cheaper wide receivers. So I'll throw a couple other guys out there that I'm at least interested in. I think uh, Dante Moncrief um, and kind of just James Washington, these really cheap uh, Pittsburgh wide receivers. I, I think they're kind of in a bounce back spot. Um, this week against Seattle um, they are at home uh, so I, I think just getting those guys uh, I mean Moncrief's probably still the number two there um, I, I think so guys bad are, last week though I dude. know right but that's what you want to you, you want to go after those no. guys that look bad it sucks no. but, um, so those those are the the ones I'm kind of on I still think Christian Kirk is the guy that I'm like locked into 
um, for as far as lower ownership at, at the position. Um, and just in general, you could maybe go to someone like MBS in Green Bay. Um, I think Cody Latimer, if he does play at 3,700, was really cheap. So I was looking at him just because of um, some of those uh, targets he was seeing were deep targets finally. Uh, there's, there's a lot of cheap guys down there. John Brown is 5,200 now, but if you're going to play Josh Allen, we didn't even talk about Josh Allen. Josh Allen is probably one of the best quarterback plays on the board. Yeah. Um, he's only 5,300. Um, so, um, people will be going back there this week. I, I will say that, uh, I played him last week in week one. Um, and so sometimes I have this weird block playing a guy two weeks in a row. Um, but Lamar is really gaining traction. I think people have the salary to get to Mahomes, So you might be able to get lower ownership on, on, than I think uh, on Josh Allen. Yeah, I know. I've seen a lot of videos and content this week about about Josh Allen, and I, I, he'll probably end up being pretty highly owned. Just okay, to, good to know. Let's talk about defenses, though, because okay. the first thing that popped into my head was just the Jets. I, they don't play until Monday night, but I, I picked up Cleveland where I could, um, and that's why defenses just popped into my mind because they're going to be playing with Trevor Simeon. I don't know if Le'Veon Bell is going to play. We haven't really heard much with the whole shoulder MRI. Supposedly it came back um, negative, so it's nothing like structural or, or long-term. In – the defensive spot this week. What exactly are you are you looking yeah. for? You have New England, who is such a heavy favorite, right? And they should dominate game script, and they should force uh, Miami to pass the ball for most of the game, which is obviously usually converting into sacks and interceptions and stuff. Um, but there's a lot of a lot of different matchups that I think I like here. Yeah, I think ownership might be really flat at, at uh, defense this week. Yeah. Normally, I hate playing <clears throat> all the way up, but um, it's a pretty great spot uh, for. Uh, the Patriots and the Ravens, like both of both of them are massive favorites. Um, I mean, at home teams like against like some of the worst offensive lines in the league, which is really important. Like, so if they do dial in pressure, that's what we want, obviously. So um, I think it might be beneficial to fade uh, the Texans. Uh, they, they do. I mean, they're pretty similarly priced as the other guys. Um, but I, I do think that they'll come in at higher ownership than the Patriots and the Ravens. Um, I'm interested in paying down for Pittsburgh. I mentioned that I think that um, they're in kind of a bounce back spot. I, I still don't really respect uh, this offensive line for Seattle um, and they're 2,400. So like they're significantly cheaper. It's rare that we get a, a defense under 2,500 on DraftKings. That's actually a home favorite. Um, yeah. So that's really important to me. Um, just game flow in general. I think Pittsburgh's going to come back and play a lot better. Um, so Pittsburgh feels like the the play last week with the 49ers in some ways, because they're, they're looking like they're going to be really low owned, but I would be shocked if at the higher stakes they, they weren't, uh, I guess, piled on. Yeah, I like Pittsburgh, too, because their run defense is so strong, and obviously that's what Seattle does best And coming back as home favorites. I mean, they always bounce back strong. Pittsburgh's a you know a headstrong team that will get their shit together eventually. So this seems like a smash spot for – I mean, maybe even stacking that defense with, you know, Ben and, and Juju or something like that. I mean, Juju's toe – I mean, if I could choose not to play someone who might be less than 100%, that's probably – yeah. what I'd end up doing even kind of like Green Bay at 3100 because they're another home favorite you know everyone's gonna be very high in Minnesota so uh, I'm assuming yeah you know. a couple, couple things um, that I just wanted to touch on quickly I, I more often than not would not play, play a quarterback with the same defense because they kind of are negatively correlated in that way for a quarterback to go completely nuts um, we really it, defensive touchdowns would kind of hurt him in that way because he's not gonna have to pass as much if they're way up um, yeah, so yeah. it's kind of a negative correlation there you, you you would rather play your defense with your running back uh, we'll see what happens with James Conner I'm interested in James Conner if he's healthy but uh, we'll see um, and then as far as the Green Bay defense another thing that we really want when targeting um, other teams is pass volume and obviously we're not going to get that with Minnesota um, the pace in that Green Bay Minnesota game is just so uh, so slow that that's one that I'm, I'm not necessarily on and, and it has to do with price as well so 3100 for Green Bay um, when you can pay down for Pittsburgh makes some sense to me but they're just so close to the Baltimore's and uh, New England's of the world that um, I think that one's a little bit of a tougher sell, but you'll get them at really low ownership. And sometimes that's all it takes at, at defense. If you just get that team uh, that's super low owned, that ends up getting a defensive touchdown, you're, you're basically there. Yeah, I feel like that's at the end of the day, that's what pushes it. Like when you look back at, at fantasy rankings at the end of the year, especially with defensive stats, it's like it's never the good teams. It's never the guys that you expected them to be. It's always the teams that scored five or six defensive touchdowns on the year, and that always gets them up there, which is pretty annoying. And uh, that's what we brought for y'all today. Do we have any closing remarks, any other week two notes that you think would be uh, helpful to the people? Yeah, I think that that's pretty much it. Um, I think it'll be fun mm -hmm. to start to do these uh, on Twitch too, because we can kind of get uh, some questions from people that might be just kind of dipping their toe into DFS uh, for the first time. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll work out a time, uh, but twitch.tv slash I also do a show every Sunday morning at 
1130 Eastern time. Uh, so check that out. Um, and if you haven't already, you have a ton of content um, up on my YouTube site. Um, so we'll have that link in the description, but uh, walk through if there's one video um, outside of Nick's to watch this week, if you're interested in DFS, go ahead and watch um, my lineup review from the $1,500 entry from last week. Um, I, I think there's a lot of really interesting strategy stuff in there. So I, I do those live on Twitch um, every Monday um, afternoon as well. Um, but that's kind of where I dig a little bit deeper. And I, I'm looking at not just my teams, but I'm looking at some other guys that I play or, that I know are playing really high stakes um, that are doing things well. And, and I think the review process in DFS in particular is one of the most important ways uh, to actually learn. So um, I'll have those videos up um, as long as uh, stuff throughout the week uh, doesn't kind of uh, cramp things up. But that's the plan to have those out on Tuesday mornings. But yeah, I think that's pretty much it. All right, awesome. Send me over that link for that video. I'll put it in the description as well. Um, we're going to shoot. We're not exactly sure what time on Fridays that we're going to be going live, but we're going to shoot for what do we say, like 2 p.m. Eastern time? maybe. Or? Like that. Yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. But it's going to be roughly sometime in the afternoon, I think will be best. All right. So make sure you're following us on social media. The Twitter handles will be down there um, and we'll keep you guys updated throughout the week for when we do go live. Joe, thank you for joining us today. Family, if you enjoyed the video, make sure you hit that thumbs up, subscribe to the channel if you're new and go follow Joe everywhere all over the interweb. Until next time.